So Paul works in the compression engineering group of National Fuel Gas. And um, the presentation is bigger isn't always better. So this is, uh, we're gonna get the geek out again with engines and compressors. So anyway, um, so the idea is looking at what might be the 100% capacity required of a compressor station. And then the de how that decision that's, that's is made right. to either have 100% of that capacity tied to one machine or to split that up between two, three, four, maybe. But anyway, so that's uh, going to be Paul's presentation. So, uh, and this is real life, not theoretical. Uh, Paul is going to be actually talking about a uh, compressor station in Pennsylvania where they went through this process to make that decision of one unit or multiple units. So anyway, here we go. All right. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. This here? Yeah. The, um, is that not working? This is working with, oh. with the PDF, actually. But Sweet. you won't be able to see it on there because it's... That's fine. Yep. Okay, can you guys hear me? All right, so Terry Cruz was supposed to be here with me as well, but unfortunately got pulled away. So as uh, Mark stated, you know, we're gonna talk about two 25 horsepower units versus one 5,000. Um, like he said, bigger isn't always better. So I know there's a lot of jokes with that, but we'll save those for later. All right, so I'm just gonna give you guys a quick overview of National Fuel for those who don't know about us. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of the entire station and then kind of go over what we uh, went through the last two years for uh, making a decision on additional units at the station. So National Fuel is a union and non-union company. We're mainly in uh, you know, the Northeast PA um, and, and New York State. We have all three parts of the business, all the way from the well pad midstream right down to distribution. Uh, we have you know, roughly 800,000 people that we serve in the utility and you know, most of our employees are within the uh, New York and PA. Uh, headquarters is in Buffalo and Erie, Pennsylvania. So as I stated, we have all three assets. Our upstream side is Seneca Resources. They're mainly doing all the drilling on the well pads. Midstream, which is where I work in National Fuel Gas Supply Corporation, we have um, just our supply corporation, our Empire Pipeline, and then our National Fuel Gas Midstream Corporation, which that is the uh, corporation I'll be talking about today. Um, I do most of my work for them, even though I'm uh, employed by Supply Corporation. And then as I stated, our downstream side of it is our, our distribution corporation. And unfortunately, this wasn't updated, but National Fuel Resources is no longer. So I have Terry's background up there. We're gonna skip him because he skipped this. Um, I've been with the company for about seven years. I'm a compression engineer, working under him. There's about five of us. Um, I have my bachelor's from mecha in mechanical and my MBA from the University of Buffalo. Also um, a CWI and uh, a subject matter, subject matter expert for National Field Gas on the welding committee. So just to keep kind of things sort of confidential, we're just gonna call this the Western PA Compressor Station. Um, it's been one of our bigger midstream stations. It's one of our most important ones in, the, in our entire system. Uh, each of the bullet points kind of breaks down how we built the station out. So we do a little different than some of the other uh, midstream companies. What we typically do is we start with a D-high facility. We um, end up free flowing gas for roughly a year. And then as the pressure start to come down, we add compression. So in the first phase, we added five, uh, five 1380 horsepower rich burn engines. Um, those were all installed in 2014. After that, we decided to add two 5,000 horsepower units, one in 2016 and one in 2018. And then um, just in 2019, we just completed a 1900 horsepower rich burn. And I'll show you the plot plan and why we kind of chose what we did. And um, just last fall, we completed with a 250 million D high to assist with the more flow. And after that, which what we're talking about is going with the addition of either another 5,000 horsepower or breaking that up into two 2,500 horsepower units. Um, so this is just a plot plan kind of blowing up on the, I don't know how to do the la is laser just in the middle, yeah. So down here is the D high facility. These were the two 150s 
Up here would have been the 250 horsepower, or I'm sorry, 250 million that was just installed. Uh, comes up the hill, and then this was our main header area. These five units were the ones that were installed in 2014. They were 1380. Um, this was the 5,000 horsepower that was installed in 2016, and then the one that was installed in 2018. And then, like I said, last in 2019, we installed the last 1,900 horsepower. So we build the header system, kind of make it easy to swap units in and out. It also gives us the flexibility as if when the wells start drying up in this area, we can pull the units out pretty simple. Um, as you can see, another factor with everything is we're starting to get limited on site. So the area we're looking at for expansion was in this corner up here, which, you know, these blocks are um, 100 feet, so there's really not that much room. So that's just a, a drone picture. This is probably a year and a half old now, but it gives you guys just a depiction. We do separate buildings. Um, I know a lot of people do one continuous building on each side of the header. We just think from a safety and reliability stance, we do separate buildings. Um, as I stated, these are the 1900s, or, or I'm sorry, 1380. This would be the 1900, and then our two 5,000 horsepower units. Uh, one thing I will bring up that is also critical to this site is these right here, these are micro turbines. Uh, we don't have power to this site, so we have to generate our power. So whenever we're investigating an option, power is always something that we look into. Okay, so now to really the whole reason for this presentation. So we had four options we really looked into uh, for the expansion in that top left corner of the pad that we were talking about. Option one was we already own two own, I'm sorry, we already own two lean burn 2500 horsepower units. Um, with electric coolers, one of our projects on the supply side of stations, it was canceled. We had already had the units purchased. Um, some of you guys might know of it as Northern Access, so there were a couple units we had left from there. Uh, option two was to take those units and then use them with an engine driven. As I stated, we make our own power here, so pulling anything off electric would assist us. Option three was to go with two brand new units, rich burn units, 2,500 horsepower with an engine driven cooler. Um, this was, you know, as we'll talk about and Ryan referenced in the last presentation, with air permitting, we know that the rich burn units get a lot better numbers. And then option four was to then just add another 5,000 horsepower unit with an electric cooler. Um, the original plan when we first were doing development was to go with option four. Uh, that was way back in 2014. So I'm not gonna go through all the specifics on the units, I don't wanna bore everyone. I know Ryan just kinda of did that with the different engines, but the two main things here, he's gone, so, oh, he's back, sorry, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> he'll get me back later for it. Um, the, two, the two main lines we're looking at are right here, is the, the NOx and the VOC. So as I stated, the, the rich burn really knock it out of the park compared to the lean burn. I know they're still close, but they're half on NOx and significantly lower on VLC. And as you guys can see with the size of this pad, we're getting very close to the GP5 permit um, limits. So th these were two of the big factors on this. So what I showed here is just original, real high level sketch designs of what we thought we were gonna do. Um, over here is just, the, like I said, we put it in this area and then I just kind of blew it up for you guys. So this would be going with the 2500 lean burns with electric coolers. You would have your unit one nine sit here, unit 10 sit there, and then the gas cooler would sit across and we'd run our main gas piping header uh, between the unit and the gas cooler. This would have been the header right here that runs along like that. Option two and three, um, one was the lean burn, one was the rich burn with engine driven. Uh, again, run the header up here. What's nice about this is the cooler sits on the back. As you can see, it's much longer, but it's a lot cleaner with piping. You don't have all the back and forth for the various stages. Uh, both of these units were three stage units as well, just to give you reference. So as most of you may know, with the gas cooler, if you have three stages, you'd have three suction discharge running between the cooler. So it creates a lot more piping and complexity for construction, especially within this tight area that we have on the site. Um, option four was to literally copy and paste this unit and this unit and throw it on the end and build it up with another 5,000 horsepower. And that was with, again, a electric gas cooler. So when we went through this, we looked at 13, call it points, that we thought were main considerations. 
Um, I'll go through all these, but you know, there was the air permit, uh, cost of equipment, buildings, piping, uh, cost of power if needed, contractor costs, pile install costs, which what we do, I know is different than most of the industry, we put most of our equipment on screw piles and not on concrete, just being in this area, as we all know, we get snow on April 21st. So it kind of assists with timing and um, just from a cost stance, we find it to be a more flexible option. And then, you know, number 13 is loss of service. So are we gonna lose, when the unit goes down, are we losing all that flow or are we losing half? So first one, so again, air permit. When you look at the options of lean burn versus rich burn, as Ryan said, we'll just skip this one for now. Um, I'm sorry, look at Knox, we'll skip, uh, where is it, Ryan, I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll skip CO. So um, it's significantly less, it's about half, and then the VOC is even a lot less. And those two factors for the GP5, if we were to go with Rich Burns, we were gonna be over the GP5, which then puts us into a Title V permit, which if any of you know, that requires a lot more testing, a lot more cost up front and just overall it puts you into a, a system you don't want to be and it could lead to having to add SRC as Ryan had spoke about in the last uh, presentation. Um, second was just the cost of all the equipment. So what I did here, um, I didn't put the actual cost just to keep it from the various packagers and everything, didn't want to spend, put their numbers up on the board, but I looked at all the different options and what would be the most expensive was going with the 2,500 horsepower units that we owned using an engine driven cooler because we didn't own those coolers and we'd have to change some of the things on the unit. That'd be the most expensive option. Option one, even though we own the units, we had to make some significant changes. They were only um, a single stage unit, so we were gonna have to convert them to a three stage. Uh, we'd have to change the coolers out and it ended up becoming pretty pricey just to change the units we owned. Third place was to go with the two 2,500 rich burn units with two engine drivens. Um, you know, like I said, they're about 80% of the total cost. And then the cheapest option, uh, which makes sense if you're doing the math, it's half the equipment, would be going with the one 5,000 horsepower lean burn. So looking at this right now, most people I'm guessing are saying, well, this is a no brainer. Why aren't we just going with this option? Let's cancel the rest of this presentation. So second one is compressor buildings. So over here on the left is the size of the 5,000 horsepower building, and then over here is the size of a 1,900 or um, even up to the 2,500 horsepower compressor buildings with an engine-driven cooler on it. Uh, significantly bigger, a lot more time to build the 5,000 horsepower you're talking. That takes about two months to build this building. We can knock these buildings out in about four weeks. So that helps with construction timing, overall cost with it, and having manpower on site. So when you're looking at it, um, the 2,500 lean burns, even though those are smaller units, the way we designed those ones for our supply side, they have a, it's a three skid system. They have a wing skid and it just assists with uh, the piping inside the unit. So unfortunately, these two options would go in a building like this. As you can see, we have two of them. So that's why those costs are up. The 2,500 horsepower can go in a modular build we can knock out two of those buildings for about 300,000. And then once again, the 5,000 would go into 600,000. So we're able to build two of the buildings for the rich burn units for the price of one of the 5,000 horsepower units. All right, so main gas yard piping. So what I looked at here, this is just a picture of the 5,000 horsepower on that site. As I stated, here is your electric cooler. You have suction discharge running back and forth. It's a three stage unit. So you have, like I said, suction discharge for one, two, and three. So it's a lot of piping. So when I went through and did the math, did all the measurements and everything, it actually ended up being roughly about the same um, on, on all of these. Uh, I know I state this down here, uh, main gas piping costs similar between options, but two units and electric coolers are more expensive. That's just from, like I said, back, uh, back to this option over here. So when I did the math, you would think, sense we have two units versus one well with going with the one unit you have all this large bore piping running back and forth whereas when you have an engine driven cooler the piping goes right off the back of the unit right to the cooler it's a lot less 
of the run. It's not a significant amount of piping. Um, to put in perspective, this is probably, by the guess, 50 feet of piping between the cooler and the unit. And the reason for that is we also have below grade the header piping coming over. So let me just back up to that. So, so don't forget, we have all this piping coming in. So that's all below grade. And then you have all this piping running back and forth. Whereas when we do an engine driven, there's just a minimal pipe between the unit and the cooler. So second, our next was the non-main gas piping. <coughs> Went through the fuel gas loop system, jack of box water. Again, even though there is two units versus one, when you do the math and everything, it basically added up to being the same. So to me, this was a mute point. We skipped over it, went on to the next one. All right, so now electrical building. What we had to do is we had to add in a new station control system uh, for ESD, just running of the units and everything. All the options were gonna require this, so across the board, it was gonna cost us $100,000 no matter what option we did with this. Prime power, as I stated, this station doesn't have its own power, so we had to make our own power. Um, the only option after we went through the study was gonna be to take our existing units that we own from Northern Access and had electric coolers. I know this says electric, but I messed up, that's on the so Has electric coolers, it would be $500,000 additional to go with that option. So again, those ones keep going out of the way. These ones across the board with the power we had on site, we always do additional, we do an N plus one. We were able to um, make sure that these three options would work. The two with the engine driven, and then the one 5,000 horsepower with the electric. We were getting close to being out of power on option four, but we were able to make it work as long as this would be the final build out of this site. Next one was the control panel. We, again, do something a little different. We add on our own control panels to these units. We don't just use Waukesha's panels um, that come standard on their engines. We add our own, it, it gives us flexibility. We use a company with, uh, I know a lot of you guys are familiar with ACI, which allows us to automate the units a little better. So we had to add a unit control panel across the board for all of these. Um, I know, you're, again, you're asking, why is this the same as this? The reason is, it's just a smaller unit, it didn't require as much. Um, the control panel, we only need one for both units, and once again, we would need to do one for that. Okay, contractor's cost. So this one was really kind of what started making me realize that we might not be going with an option for here. Is as I reached out to a couple contractors and looked at past projects, what I had them come up with is that the gap was significantly narrowed between one 5,000 horsepower and two of the 2,500 horsepower Richmond's. And the main point of that was because of all that piping running between the cooler and the unit. Just obviously the size of the engine, the larger building, um, the more of the structural steel inside the buildings, that those units sit raised, whereas the 2,500 horsepower, which I'll touch on the next slide, sit on the gravel grout foundation. So it doesn't require as much structural steel. So to put in two units, it was only gonna cost us roughly $500,000 more. So again, as I stated earlier, we put all our equipment on piles. Here's a little picture of them before they get cut down. Um, when I went through it, these units, because they're on a three skid, would sit on piles, roughly 60 piles a unit. So that's a significant amount. Then we put all our piping, our building, and really any of the main gas equipment on piles. Um, that's why these two equal out together. Option three, you're asking why is this so much lower? It's another two 2,500 horsepower units. Well, what we did is we reached out to Southwest and the company pile contractor we uses Alpine out of Colorado. Um, we performed a study and did a vibration thermal pulsation study and we were actually able to get away with how smooth these rich burn engines run I'm putting them on a compacted gravel foundation. Uh, put in perspective, that's roughly $25,000 to $30,000 for that gravel foundation. Whereas with the 5,000 horsepower unit, we did the same study. It was gonna fail the foundation. So we put those on piles. As I stated, you got 60 some piles just for the unit alone. That's why these units are so similar in pricing. So this is kind of a summary of all the points of considerations we just went through. As you're looking through right away, this and this are completely wiped out. 
They're a lot more expensive, but we got down to three and four, and we looked at, you know, somebody might say, well, 2.6 million is a lot of money. Well, that's what we thought at first, but after talking with operations, talking with our gas control and what it would cost if one of the units went down, we started looking at this. So, as we all know, compressor packages are, have a lot of moving parts, especially resets. They require a lot of maintenance, um, you know, oil, cylinders, just overall, they're always having something go wrong with them. It's just the nature of the beast. So, like I said, there was a $2.6 million dollar difference between the two. If one 5,000 horsepower unit went down for 1,200 hours, roughly, or 52 days, you would make up the price in that difference right away. So to us, this was based on this math, you know, 5,000 horsepower flow on 40 million at a gas price of 1.26, which you know, to me is reasonable right now. Um, one hour of downtime costs the company $2,100. So after doing that math, like I said, in 52 days, that's made up. I would say on average, a unit has PNs every six, six months. They're down for four to five days. You're making that time up a lot. That's also not talking about just unplanned downtime. Something goes wrong. The unit gets clogged with something. Uh, that, that gets made up real quick. I would say in two years, you're, you're making that difference up. So what we thought was, is if we could have two of the units, taking one unit offline allows for half the flow, therefore we're only losing half of this revenue, um, and still being able to run the unit. It doesn't create a lot of issues with the well pads. When you shut off units, you create an issue with the pressure. It ends up allowing the well pads to suck up the sand and none of all that crap that gets inside your pipelines. It creates a lot of issues when you don't have that consistent pressures and flows to the pipeline. So after going through that, we kind of did a, a, a rating system of all the main three categories that we thought. So upfront cost, like I said, the 5,000 horsepower from that slide one was a no-brainer. It's a lot cheaper. Operational flexibility, you know, we thought option one, two, and three, it gives you that flexibility if one unit goes down or you can shut one down while you're working on maintenance, still have half the flow. Option four, if you shut that unit down, you're losing all your flow. Obviously, these two units were more expensive, so we weren't even looking at it. And then last but not least, as we talked about and Ryan had touched on, was the GP5 emissions permit. When we went through the study, the only option that was going to keep us under GP5 was the two 2,500 horsepower rich units. So we decided to go with that just based on where everything's going with permitting. It gives us the flexibility. I showed you guys the pad. We're out of site, or I'm sorry, out of room. If we do expand that site, which who knows, it could happen. We could still be under GP5 by adding another couple rich burn engines there. And I know it says GMC, but thank you guys, I appreciate it. Any questions? Don't actually, which is shocking. So that side, we have two territories. We have the WDA, which is where this is at, and then the EDA, which is closer to like the Williamsport area. We see more issues on the H2S there, whereas this gas is pretty clean. So we don't run into that. Any other? Well, Ryan talked about some of the hot gas that's entering the pipes. And we keep talking about natural gas engines, but are these engines running off of field gas or are they running off of pipeline gas? So we use a fuel gas skid, which is running off of pipeline gas, but we do treat the gas. And, and um, we have filtration, we have a fuel gas heater, and everything. But our gas, we, we design our stations roughly 60 degree gas in temperature coming in, but we do have a heater, we do have a fuel gas system to treat that gas to run the engines on. But it's nothing other than a couple filter separators and some T-strings. So you are getting water gas into the engine? In this area because of the Marcellus? Yep. And one more question. Um, are you familiar with Lion N20? 
No. It's a national field pipeline coming down from Erie down to uh, Texas Eastern. I'm just as curious as if, if they're struggling with their BTU threshold still. I, I don't know that. I don't do pipeline. I'm only in compression, so unfortunately. Thank you. Yep. What's causing you to have micro turbines on one of your stations? Uh, in talks with the decision, make sure it's not selecting micro turbines versus pieces. So the original thought when we built the micro turbines, that was back in 2012, I believe is when we went with that. So um, I wasn't part of the decision of micro turbines versus recips, unfortunately. I do know we are looking into your guys' technology more and more. Um, but at that point, it just, that's kind of what we went down. Like I said, to get power up to the site was astronomical. Um, it's roughly 12 miles down a, a dirt road up in the middle of nowhere. So to bring power didn't make sense. So that's why we went with micro turbines. So midstream stations, how it's dictated is it's the first system right from the well pad. So that's the first station from the well pad. So to that station we have, I don't know, 20 pads that could tie into it. And then that sends it to an interconnect. And from there it would be a supply station going forward, a transmission station. Questions? Good. All right, thank you guys.